We want to welcome you all here. We want to thank you for uh, choosing to worship the Lord with us this morning. Uh, just a quick special announcement. October 29th. Who knows what October 29th is? What? The end of the month? It is the end of the month. That's true. Does anybody know what happens on October 29th? Yeah, we're going <laughs> to... We're going to vote... To seek the Lord's will on Pastor Jeremy as the as the next senior pastor. So, what is your job? To, well, yeah, <laughs> to come, but also to be praying, right? We're all seeking the Lord. We want His will to be done in this, right? And so, um, be be spending time in prayer and then just seeking Him for that. So, um, yeah, October 29th, Make sure you're here. Uh, if you need a, uh, if you're going to be out of town, you can get an absentee ballot from the uh, from the. Uh, Oh, what is the, the thing? The office. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, oh, we just thank you so much that, that we can be here together, Lord, and that we can just uh, worship you today, that we can hear your word, be a family together, Lord, fellowshipping, and Lord, just bringing honor and praise and glory to you in, in what we do. We thank you for our family here. We thank you, Lord, for our salvation and for the gift of your son. Lord, we thank you for being the great and mighty God of the universe who is always good, is always just, and is always holy. And so, Lord, we ask that your spirit would be with us as we just kind of come together, Lord, as a family to praise and worship you. We love you so much. And all God's people said, amen. We have a first reading this morning, so like we like to do, I shall read the odd verses, and you shall read the even verses. Ready? This is Psalm 33, the first 12 verses. It says, Shout for joy to the Lord, O you righteous, praise befits the upright. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully on the strings and with loud shouts. righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap, and he puts the deep in storehouses. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, and the plans of his heart to all generations. done great things. Amen? All right. Let's sing together.
So at this time, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward. Um, let me pray for our offering. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we just want to thank you that we can come together, Lord, and, and to worship and serve you today. We ask that you be honored in everything we do, Lord, in, in the, the worship and through giving and, and through everything we do in our life, Lord. We just we want to go to heaven one day, Lord, and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We just love you so much, and we thank you. In your name we pray, and all God's people say. For eternity, join the song they're already singing. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Just to bow down before your throne, see your face, I'll cry out because you're holy, holy. Holy are you, Lord. Jesus, King of Kings. Jesus, Stand with us. I can't wait for eternity. 
is worthy, isn't he? Worthy is the Lord. praise, Lord. We ask that you receive our worship today with gladness and joy, that your spirit would be active in our hearts. Lord, as we prepare to, to hear your word and to receive your instruction, we just love you so much, Lord, and we want to thank you so much for the privilege that we have, Lord, of just being together here with, with each other and with you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, we have a guest speaker here today, uh, Dr. Jim Coakley. So uh, he is a professor at Moody uh, in the Bible department and a professor of Bible and, in the undergraduate program. And he is uh, author of a number of books, uh, most recently, 14 Fresh Ways to Enjoy the Bible. That sounds super, that's a great title, by the way. I really, it makes me really want to go read it. I love for some fresh ways to enjoy the Bible. And so I'd encourage you, go, look for it, buy it, all right? So there's a plug for you. But even more so than that, he, he's also done a number of other contributions. He actually contributed to the book of Numbers in the Moody Bible Commentary, which I'm a huge fan of the Moody Bible Commentary. And I, again, I'm not biased because I'm in their MDiv program right now, all right? It's just a good commentary. So I'd encourage you to look it up. Uh, but Jim's gonna come speak to us from the book of Numbers. And before he comes, I'm gonna pray for him but I'd also be remiss if we didn't mention uh, just the war and the issues going on in Israel. Um, and so we do want to intentionally, there's times where we just take breaks and awkwardness in services for certain situations, and this is one of those. Um, we also want to remember those that are in, there's war-torn countries across the world that are suffering. And so as we think of Israel, we also remember them as well. So I'm going to pause our service right here. We're going to lift up Israel right now and the Palestine conflict and then I'm gonna pray also for Jim at the same time. So would you join me in prayer? Uh, Lord, we love you. We're so thankful again that you are our God and that you have all things in control and you have a plan at work. And Lord, even in the midst of us not understanding conflict and war, we, we beg and we intercede for our brothers and sisters in Israel right now that are hurting and that are dying. And we ask for your help. We know you're at work, we know you have a plan, but we ask for peace in that time. We ask the same for those other countries that are in war and that have been in war for years, the conflict in the Middle East and across the world. We look forward to your soon return. And in the light of that soon return, give us open ears and open hearts to your word today that we may be prepared to go to battle, but also to, to bring peace. And it's your peace, Lord, to those around us. So again, I lift up our brothers and sisters in Israel to you today and those in Palestine. We ask for your help and your guidance in that situation. Be with uh, Dr. Coakley as he comes today. And we were so thankful that Jim's here to speak to us today. Give us again open ears and open hearts to what he would be saying to us through your word. And we th are so thankful again for your word to come this morning. Lord, we love you and we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. It is a joy to be here at Mission Bible Church. I'm really good friends with Dr. Ryan Cook. Uh, we were colleagues together in the seminary where I taught for about 17 years. I've been the last five years teaching in the undergrad, but we still meet. Uh, we're prayer partners. We meet every week. And uh, so it's a great uh, privilege of mine to be at his home church uh, to be able to open God's word. Now, I was a pastor for 13 years, like Ryan was before he came to Moody. Uh, we also have this in common. Uh, one time I led a trip to uh, Europe to do a missions trip with seminary students, and we were at a, a missions organization was having us kind of do things while they were kind of having their annual meeting. And at the end of the meeting, one of the ladies, one of the missionaries came to me and she says, you know what? I have never met a Hebrew professor with social skills before. So I do have some social skills, and I know Dr. Cook does as well. So uh, I know that you are blessed to have his presence here, uh, a Hebrew professor with social skills. So uh, we shared that, that same trait. 
I have uh, contributed to the Moody Bible Commentary on the book of Numbers, so I knew if I opened and challenged you from the book of Numbers, probably not too much has ever been shared about the book of Numbers, so I know I would be on some new ground. Uh, but I also wanted to share with you, too, not just a message from the book of Numbers, but also to help you. I'm a teacher, just like Dr. Cook, and I can't help but also, while I'm sharing God's Word, teach you how to better understand God's Word on your own. And like Jeremy said, I just had the privilege of, of really having this book published in March uh, called 14 Fresh Ways to Enjoy the Bible. And it really is my passion to not just understand and teach the Word of God, but to teach others how to get more out of it when they read it. And I think you'll see how I can help you even this morning with skills, not just the scriptures. And so that's my goal here this morning. So we're going to talk about the book of Numbers. Of course, that's part of the Pentateuch, the Torah. Genesis is the beginning. Exodus, we can say get out. Leviticus is get right. Numbers is get going. And we're going to see the nation of Israel get going. But before they get going, there's this section of the book of Numbers that I want to really highlight for you. Now, I'm going to give a little quiz. So one question, and I'm not going to give any grades, but why is it, do you think, that Moses was forbidden to enter the promised land? Why was Moses forbidden to enter the promised land? Who has a quick answer for that? Why was he forbidden? Sin. What? Sin. Sin. That's, that's too easy of an answer. <laughs> what? Yeah, he struck the rock twice. And so we normally associate uh, that with the, his anger, and that's why he was forbidden to enter into the promised land. But that's actually not what the text says. The text says that he was forbidden to go into the promised land, not because of his anger, but because of something else. So turn to Numbers chapter 20, and we'll see something that the text foregrounds in terms of why is it that Moses, the leader of God's people, was not permitted to go into the promised land with the rest of the people. And this is what we read. Numbers chapter 20 and verse 12. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough. Or as the ESV says, because you did not believe me. You shall therefore not enter or bring this assembly into the land that I am giving to them. So it doesn't say that he was forbidden to enter because of anger, but because of unbelief a lack of faith. And so the Pentateuch, the Torah, is really encouraging readers to have faith, to have more trust in the God who's leading them. And so that's what we want to notice as we go through the book of Numbers. But when we think about this tragic incident in Moses' life, I want to go back and review the earlier chapters of Number, Numbers to see if there's something that we can observe that helps to explain why all of a sudden in Numbers chapter 20, Moses has unbelief. He doesn't have trust. He doesn't have faith. Well, there's one incident in Numbers chapter 10, and I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 10. It'll be on the screen as well. But we have this incident that's embedded in the book of Numbers. Now, before we get further in the book of Numbers, most of the time we think that the whole book of Numbers is about the wilderness wandering period. Well, that happens starting chapter 11. But they're not wandering yet. This is before the spy incident. This is before other things. Because I want you to see the first 10 chapters have something thematically about them that we often miss. And I'm going to foreground that for you this morning. But there's this incident in Numbers chapter 10, and it deals with Hobab. So let's get the background. So they were now getting ready to go on the march, to go to the promised land. And Moses has a sidebar conversation with a relative. His name is Hobab. So let's look, Numbers chapter 10, starting at verse 29. Now Moses said to Hobab, son of Ruel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law. Okay, so this is family. 
we are setting out for the place that the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will treat you well, for the Lord has promised good things to Israel. He answered, no, I will not go. I'm going back to my own land and my own people. But Moses said, please do not leave us. You know where we should camp in the desert and you can be our eyes. He goes on to say, if you come with us, we will share with you whatever good things the Lord gives us. So basically, Moses says to his relative, Hobab, hey, I want you to come along with us. You can be our scout. You know this terrain, you know this area. Why don't you come along with us and you know where the water is, you know where the campsites are. You will be a great asset for us as we now go towards the promised land. Now, when we think about this request, this is something very typical we encounter whenever we read narrative-like texts like this one. And so there's then this question about how we should view Moses' request of Hobab. We can view it in one of two ways. We can view it in the sense of positive. We can view it in the sense that it's just like proverbial wisdom. In the multitude of counselors, there is great wisdom. Or as Proverbs 11:14 says, for lack of guidance, a nation fails or falls, but victory is won through many advisors. So we can look at this and say, yeah, Moses, that's a good move. You're asking for additional help. You're asking for some consultation with people who know the area. That's positive, that's good proverbial wisdom. Get counsel, get help, get outside counsel on this matter. But on the other hand, we can also view it the exact opposite way, that this is negative. How can we view this request negatively? Because remember, the text doesn't tell us this is positive or negative. And this is the challenge when we read narrative books. We have them showing us rather than telling us as to how we should experience or view a character's actions. So the author of Numbers, Moses, doesn't tell us whether we should view this positively or negatively. So how can we view this negatively? Well, I want you to back up just a little bit. Go to chapter 7 and verse 89, and it tells us that when Moses entered a tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the atonement cover on the ark of the testimony, and he spoke with him. Moses had a direct hotline to God. So he could talk face to face with God. He had done that many, many times already. But he also had something else. If you go to chapter nine, we realize that just the chapter before, we read about this kind of strange GPS system. It's the pillar of fire and the cloud. And it goes through all sorts of details about when you see this pillar of fire move, you set out. And when you see the cloud stop, you stop. So basically, your GPS coordinates will be given to you because you have already a guidance system. So now we have then, I think, the context to try to begin to understand, is this a positive thing that Moses asked a relative to come, come alongside him to find out where the best water holes are and where the best campsites they should set up at night? Or is this Moses beginning to waver just a little bit and say, I want a backup plan. I want a plan B just in case God doesn't come through. So this is the question that I want us to ponder. What is it about God's will and plan Bs or backup plans? Now, Proverbs does say it's good to have counsels, but when it comes to God's clear revealed will, or when you have a specific instruction to follow, do we need to have a plan B in those situations? But I think beyond just the idea of the context here, I want you to look at what happens next. Chapter 11 follows this request of Moses of Hobab. And what we're going to find there is that they're going to grumble and complain. They're going to start really giving Moses a hard time. 
Now, was this complaining or murmuring or being very resistant to Moses? Was this their plan of action up until this time? No, up to this point, they have not murmured or complained, at least in the book of Numbers. So is there something about this next chapter, chapter 11, that helps us to understand the request that Moses has with Hobab? I think that there is. So let's take a look at Numbers chapter 11, the first three verses. Now the people complained. So this is Numbers chapter 11. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. So now God gets hot. He gets angered. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. And when the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So that the place was called Tabara because fire from the Lord had burned among them. So this is the first time that the people murmur and complain and mumble. And what does God do? Judges them, harshly, severely. But why now? Why at this point? Here now, I want to go back and look at the first 10 chapters and review some key themes from those early 10 chapters. But I think you see the setup. Chapter 10, Moses asked for a backup plan with Hobab. Chapter 11, the people murmur and complain. But what's happening in the first 10 chapters that we should be aware of prior to these incidents? So I want to notice and put out two things that stand out in the first 10 chapters. One theme is Israel's obedience. The other is God's presence. So now I want to quickly go through we're going to fly through these, but I just want you to get the overall deep impression that there's a pattern going on, a repeated phrase, all the way through the first 10 chapters in regards to Israel's obedience. And so we begin seeing it even in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 19, as the Lord commanded Moses, and so he counted them in the desert of Sinai. As the Lord commanded Moses, he counted them. We come to the end of chapter 1, verse 54. What do we read? The Israelites did all this just as the Lord commanded Moses. So the first chapter, we have two incidences of where the people are obedient, just as the Lord commanded. Well, what about chapter 2? Same thing in chapter 2. Verse 33, we read this. The Levites, however, were not counted along with the other Israelites as the Lord commanded Moses. So Levites were left out of the census. Verse 34, so the Israelites did everything the Lord commanded Moses. That is the way they encamped under their standards. And they set out each with their clan and family. Obedience. Twice in chapter 1, two more times in chapter 2, and four times in chapter 3. Just quickly again, verse 16, so Moses counted them as he was commanded by the Lord. Verse 39, the total number of Levites counted at the Lord's command uh, according to their clans. Then verse 42, Moses counted all the firstborn as the Lord commanded him. And then we have 51, Moses gave the redemption money to Aaron and his sons as he was commanded by the Lord. Do you see the pattern? They're doing everything that the Lord commands. The Lord commands, they do it. The Lord commands through Moses, they do it. They are obedient. This is great. This is the way life should be under a sovereign God who commands what they should do. Chapter 4, we have four more occurrences. Now, I'm not going to take the time to read them, but I think you already see there's a pattern here, right? All the way through these early chapters of Numbers, we see the Israelites being obedient, just as they should. Now we get to chapter 5, and we read, now this is a kind of a, a different section, but in chapter 5 and verse 4, the Israelites did this. They sent them outside the camp. They did this just as the Lord instructed Moses. Now there's a little bit of a gap from chapter 5 until we get to chapter 8, where we don't see anything about the issue of obedience, but I'll come back to that. And what's the theme of that section? Well, let's skip over then to chapter 8. Three more times we see the people being obedient. Same thing in chapter 9, 
chapter nine, verse five, and they did so in the desert of Sinai at twilight and on the 14th day of the first month, the Israelites did everything just as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, the author couldn't say this if they were being obedient because they did everything just as the Lord commanded Moses. And then just before our incident, uh, we have in 1013, we have the same thing where we have the fact that the people are being obedient. And so what does it say? 1013, they set out this first time at the Lord's command through Moses. Obedience 18 times is repeated in these first 10 chapters. Obedient, no disobedience, none. You can't find it anywhere in the first 10 chapters. They do everything the Lord commands. But we also notice another theme, and that's the theme of God's presence. Now, one of the things that they're all camped around is a structure called the tabernacle. So now there's the tabernacle, and that's the epitome of God's presence. They're living in tents. What is a tabernacle? It's a movable tent, and it's in the center of their camp. So God's tent is in the midst of their tent. So God's home, God's dwelling, is right in the midst of them, at the center. That's the tabernacle. That's God's presence, very clearly manifested with the fire and the cloud also hovering over it. And what is the tabernacle? It's a miniature, as it were, Garden of Eden. It's full of colors, all the colors that were put into uh, making that tabernacle. It's got the cherubim which are protecting God's glory, just like we saw in the Garden of Eden, protecting the way in so that Adam and Eve could not go back in. We also have the menorah, which is like a tree, like the tree of life. So the, all the artifacts and pieces of furniture in a tabernacle, the big picture is this is a miniature, movable Garden of Eden because that's where God's presence is. So God sets up his IMAX 3D color uh, home right in the midst of their dull burlap tents. So this is God's presence right among them. And like I said, we also have that fire and cloud hovering over it. And then in chapter nine, what do we have? Notice in chapter nine, we are celebrating a Passover celebration. And what does that Passover event celebrate? God's presence in protecting the people of Israel who had the mark of the blood on the doorposts and the lentils of their house so that when the judging angel came over Egypt, God protected them by his presence. And so all through that middle section, there is God's presence. But there's also something else that's going on. Go back to chapter 6. This is in that part that we don't really have any uh, mentions of Israel being obedient, but there's a very important section that kind of seems like it's just tossed in there, unrelated to what's around it. And I think if you should know anything about God's word, nothing is by circumstance or happenstance. Things are placed the way they are for a reason. We get to chapter 6, and we have the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. This is what we should be praying as was praying already for Israel even this morning with what they're going through. But when God's face is shining upon you, looking on you, that's his presence. You're right there in the midst of God's presence. So notice the two themes are repeated all through these first 10 chapters. Obedience, they're doing exactly everything that the Lord commands through Moses. And God's presence, the tabernacle, Passover, the pillar, the cloud, everything is just right. Everything is set in the right place for now the nation of Israel to start making their way to get going towards the promised land. But there's one thing I want you to notice that we often miss because we are more what I call linear in our Bible reading. But I want you to look at this chart because this chart gives us the actual day and month 
of which certain events that happened in these early chapters of Numbers. Now, it doesn't mean much to us because these don't really matter too much to us in terms of uh, what kind of Hebrew months we're talking about. But we have, for instance, day one of the second year after the Exodus, uh, the first month. So we would say that what? First month, day one would be like our January one. Then we have day 12 on the first month. That would be like January 12th. And then we get to day 14 of the first month. That's when the Passover is celebrated. But I want you to notice something. The text is chronologically out of order. Now, it's not a mistake, but it catches us off guard because we assume that the Bible is given to us in chronological linear order, but it's not. Because if you go to Numbers chapter 1, you notice something. The first verse tells us what census was taking place. The Lord said, to Moses in the tent of meeting in the desert of Sinai on the first day of the second month, which would be our February 1st. But the book starts in February, but then goes back to January. That's odd. Why are they messing with the calendar? I think there's a thematic reason why. Because at the census, if you take a look at when the census is, it comes on the second month, on day one. If the census is in the correct order, we don't read about the census until chapter nine, we are going to miss the thematic connection that celebration comes after obedience. And so we kind of front load the census up front, but then we talk about obedience, 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 Passover, because one of the great things that we can do if we are obedient people and we're enjoying the presence of God is we can celebrate. And they celebrated the Passover. So now we get that census out of the way up front so that we don't miss the celebratory mood that is there in the nation of Israel as they've been obedient for these first 10 chapters. So this is subtle but it's something that the Bible does on occasion. And so if you want more, you can get to my book. I have a whole chapter on what I call out of order, where there's several other accounts in the Bible where they're out of order. The Tower of Babel incident uh, with the Table of Nations, the whole incident with uh, Jesus and the ordering of the temptations in the wilderness is out of order, different between Matthew and Luke. And there's theological reasons for it. It's not a problem for believing the Bible. It's because the biblical authors are not just concerned about writing history. They are. They're concerned about giving people theological messages and sermons and application while they're writing. And on occasion, they rearrange the order of events for thematic theological messaging. So it's not just pure history. It is meant to go for your heart, to go for your life change. But there's something about what I want to consider as well. Is that now, like we've mentioned, is that Israelites already have the cloud. They already have God's presence. So why on earth is Moses looking for a backup plan? Why does he want Hobab's advice and counsel when they already have what God has already provided for them? And like we've already noticed, up to this point, obedience has been stressed. But all of a sudden now, we get to this point in chapter 11 where they murmur and complain. What happened? What gives? Is there a cause-effect relationship here? Well, let's now slow down and relook at that passage we read earlier from Numbers chapter 10 about Moses asking Hobab. And I think some lights will go on when you consider what's happening in the immediate context with what is happening with Moses' request. Hobab is labeled a Midianite. Now, for most of us, that doesn't mean a whole lot. Israelite, Midianite, Girgashite, Jebusite, doesn't mean anything. But there's something communicated by that ethnic label. And this is something that we need to pay close attention to when we're reading the Bible. The biblical author can just give a person's name, but sometimes they give occupations, Rahab the harlot. Sometimes they give ethnic labels, 
Ruth the Moabitess. Sometimes they do all sorts of other things uh, by using pronouns instead of the proper name or titles that are given. Just think of all the titles Jesus has. He's Jesus, he's Lord, he's Jesus Christ, he's Savior, he's Rabbi, he's Teacher, all those things. Those are all labels. Pay attention to the different labels that biblical authors use. So this was used in this text to say that Hobab is a Midianite. So we also notice what he says. Hey, I'm going home. I'm going to call it quits. I'm going to go back home. I'm going to leave you guys. So he's what we might call the anti-Abraham. Remember, Abraham was told to leave his father's country and go to a land I will show you. And Abraham did. He was obedient. But Hobab wants none of this. He wants to just go back home. So now, what else do we know about the Midianites? So let's go through and do a quick scan of the Midianites as a people. Who is Midian? Well, Midian was one of the offspring of Abraham through his wife, Keturah. Now, we know Abraham was to have the child of promise, the child of blessing, through Sarah, and we know him to be Isaac, who was born to Sarah. But before Isaac was born, what happened? Abraham jumped the gun, slept with Hagar, and they had Ishmael. Was that a good move or a bad move? That was a bad move. And now we have Keturah, and one of the other six sons that Abraham had through Keturah is a son by the name of Midian. So that's the background. He comes through Keturah, not through Sarah. And we know already that sometimes offspring of Abraham don't do too kindly with the nation of Israel. And that's what happens. Just a few chapters later, who is part of the contingent to sell Joseph down to Egypt? Our group, the Midianites. So are they good people or bad people? They're willing to take Joseph down and sell him as a slave. So the Midianites are involved with selling Joseph down to Egypt. Now Moses then, after he has found out that he murdered the Egyptian slave master, flees and goes down to Egypt, and he meets some Midianite women, and he marries one of them. Hence now the situation where he's now married into a Midianite. Uh, married, he marries the priest's daughter of a Midianite. And so this is now Moses seemingly coming off more as an Egyptian because that's who they said the daughters say to dad when they got home early that day, an Egyptian helped us at the well. So Moses is hiding his identity and holding up with people who are seemingly more allied with Egypt. So Moses is around with Midianites. Ah, and then you read later on in the book of Numbers, after the situation with Balaam didn't turn out so well for what the king of Moab wanted to do, which was to curse Israel, the Midianites come in and they entice the nation of Israel to sin at Baal Peor, chapter 24. Do you see a pattern here? Are the Midianites good people or bad people? They're not so good. And this is the clincher to me. You go to Numbers chapter 31. This is Moses speaking. And this is now what Moses says about the Midianites. So he pulls aside and he instructs, uh, or the Lord instructs Moses, take vengeance on the Midianites for the, uh, for the Israelites. After that, you shall be gathered to your people. So Moses said to the people, arm some of your men to go to war against the Midianites. Moses is instructed to go to war against his own family. Why? Because they've been a thorn in the side of Israel from the beginning. Moses is asking Hobab, the Midianite, for advice. Good move, bad move. You see, the evidence here contextually is at least this is not a super positive move. You might say it's neutral, but now when we start to collect all of this, in fact, you read later in the book of Judges, who is Gideon fighting against? The Midianites, who sweep in like a, a, a locust horde and take every foodstuff that the Israelites have grown during that growing season. And so when you boil it all down, 
Moses is putting his trust in a Midianite. So now, what appears to be a kind of a neutral or even positive request for Hobab to be his guide in the wilderness is actually, I think, the seed of unbelief that's crept into Moses' mind. And by the time we get a few chapters later, 10 chapters later to chapter 20, it's going to be a blowout. And we often say the spiritual life is seldom a blowout, but is usually a slow leak. We normally don't one day say, I'm going to disobey the Lord. But we take little, little steps moving away from the Lord, and then we finally go over the edge. And I think that's what's happening with Moses. By the time we get to chapter 20, he has full-blown unbelief, lack of trust. But that didn't start in chapter 20. It started here in chapter 10, when he wanted a backup plan to what God clearly said was their guidance system already. And so what is it then that we should be thinking about the will of God and plan B's? Sometimes, let's admit, it is wise to have a plan B. You know, that's why it's in the book of Proverbs. You want to be able to use wisdom to live your life. So there's nothing wrong necessarily about plan B's. Sometimes they are very good. If this doesn't work out, I can do this. That can be very wise life. But on the other hand, when God has clearly revealed his will, it's downright dangerous to then concoct a plan B. And I think that's what's happening here. I am grateful that sometimes there's flexibility in God's will. Uh, it's kind of a minor little issue, but I think it's, to me, it's a great illustration that there is flexibility sometimes that God gives his children. Where during the wilderness period, one of the things that God provided for them is manna. Now, it's a little injunction in there, but to me, it's very helpful to think about what this is in the context of this message. It tells the Israelites, when it comes to manna, bake what you will bake or boil what you will boil. In other words, you have options on the menu. You can have baked manna or you can have boiled manna. Which one do you want? You choose. How many of you would be for baked manna? How many of you for boiled manna? Oh, you don't like dumplings? Come on. You see the point? Sometimes God gives complete flexibility. You can choose. So it's not like we're robotic, but in the case where God has given specific instructions and we decide, nah, I'm going to go another way. I want to have a, another plan just in case. That's when it gets dangerous. And I think, sadly, that's what we see what happens with Moses. So I'm going to ask that hard question. Do you have a plan B just in case God doesn't come through for you? What about that spouse, potential spouse? Well, they're not a believer, but God wants me to be happy, right? So if God doesn't provide a believing spouse or mate for me, I can go ahead and marry outside the Lord, right? Plan B, wrong. What about, well, I can compromise, you know, some standards here and there in order to fit in with the crowd. Plan B, but in disobedience to God's revealed will. So I want to wrap up this morning with some things about, first of all, what, we, what I did this morning to help you with how to read your Bible better for a future when you read it on your own. Realize, first of all, that narratives do often show rather than tell. They don't often explicitly tell you what you should think about a character's actions in the text. Moses doesn't say, hey, what I did here was bad. But he lets you know, contextually speaking and otherwise, that it wasn't a good move. But you have to use your mind to see all the clues contextually are put in there. Look at the character references, not just the names, 
But look at the other labels that are given. Hobab, the Midianite. Look for themes that are stressed in the context, like obedience, which is repeated over 18 times in these first 10 chapters, or God's presence, which is highlighted and foregrounded over and over again. And this one is sometimes, this is subtle, passages are abutted against each other because there is a connection. So even though the text would say, oh, the reason why the people murmured and complained is because Moses asked for a backup plan. No, but by putting those two accounts next to each other, you at least have pause to rethink about, is there a connection? Because biblical authors are subtle sometimes along those lines. Well, let me share what the big idea of the message I have for you this morning. Two points to it. When there is obedience and a commitment to purity, because that's the reason why you have to stay pure in the camp is so that God's tent doesn't get defiled. When there is obedience and a commitment to purity and holy living, the result is wonderful. The presence of a loving God who blesses. That's why that ironic blessing is right in the midst of all this obedience in God's presence. This is good. This is what we shoot for. This is what we long for. His obedience, holy living, God's face to shine upon. That's what they had during that first section. But the counterpoint is where there is disobedience and where there is lack of purity, the result, I think, sadly, is murmuring, complaining, grumbling, and a restlessness where you're looking for other ways to accomplish living. And so this is then the big idea for this passage. Some applications as we close. God's presence is a powerful tool to celebrate. That's why we gather here every Sunday at Mission Bible Church, isn't it? We want to celebrate God's presence. He is worthy. He is faithful. He is loving. And we can celebrate his presence. And that is something that we can celebrate. But when God has clearly revealed through his word, his will, don't seek a backup plan or a plan B. Now, of course, this presupposes that you have a deep understanding of the Word of God. And that's what I'm glad that the Mission Bible Church does, faithfully teach and and, uh, give out God's Word. This one may be a little tough. Faith commitments need to be stronger than family commitments. As much as we love our relatives, and God placed us in a group of people who we're connected to blood-wise, sometimes they are not the ones we should look for guidance. So faith commitment should be stronger than bloodline and family relationships. And this one too, you're now going to be in the process of having a new senior pastor. I hope you realize and pray for your pastors and your elders. That's a very high and holy responsibility. And leaders know deep down that they are accountable for how they lead. Most leaders, yes, sometimes they like power, but they don't last very long, at least in ministries, because they get rooted out. But leaders who understand that they have to set the tone. They have to set the bar. Because sadly, as we see what happened with Moses, it had ripple effect in the congregation. And as Moses was just starting to entertain some doubt and disbelief in God's trust and God's workings, all of a sudden now, that caused a tsunami of disobedience among the people. Now, everyone is accountable, I get it, for their own actions. But as the leader, so goes the nation. As the pastor, oftentimes, so goes the church. So pray for your staff, pray for your pastors, that they will be the role models of faith and trust and obedience so that you can follow in their footsteps, you can follow in their wake. Well, let's talk, though, about, this was back then. What about today? Let me just give you 
by way of application, two principles that we get clearly from the New Testament, what I know to be God's will for you all today. And that is, God's will is very clear in regards to sexual ethics. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 tells us, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Can't get any plainer than that. You want to know what God's will is in regards to your sexual ethics? Don't get involved in any form of sexual immorality. That's God's will. 1 Thessalonians 4 says that very plainly. You know what else is God's will? That you be people with gratitude. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's gratitude. So there's many more elements that God's will is for all of us. But there's two very clear ones, that we be sexually pure and that we be grateful people. If you're not following God's will in those two areas, you have your marching orders. God wants us to be pure sexually, but also to be people who express gratitude. Now, my hunch is that unless we follow God's clear revealed will, God's not going to help us with the things along the way because we've turned our back on what he's already clearly said that we should do. And so this is then why it's so important when we know God's word says something and we don't do it, God is no longer obligated to give us any more guidance until we follow that which he's already given. So this is why it's very important for us when we know something to be clearly what God has commanded us to practice, that we do it. And then as we obey, we can uh, enjoy the face of God smiling on us, blessing us, and then we can celebrate. That's really the blessing of all these things. So let me close with Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. What's that? The book of Numbers. During the time of testing in the desert, chapters 11 and forward, where your fathers tested and tried me for 40 years, saw what I did. That is why I was angry with this generation, and I said, their hearts are always going astray. They have not known my ways. First and foremost, you need to know God's word. You need to read God's word. Not only read it, study it, but you need to live it. You need to be obedient to it. And if you will be that at Mission Bible Church, you will enjoy God's presence, God's favor, and you can celebrate. But if not, and you go your own way, you can expect grumbling, complaining, and leaders that are not going to be the type that you want. Now, it's not always that cut and dry, but these are the general patterns and trajectories that God's word has. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you even for this book of Numbers, which is not something we normally think about very often in terms of advice and counsel for how we should go about our living. But we are grateful that the general themes of this passage, obedience and presence, our hallmarks of our walk with you even today. And Father, we do want your face to shine upon us. We do want your countenance to be looking with favor upon what we do. So Father, as we live out our lives as believers, may we truly live out your clear revealed will. And even in the areas we mentioned today, in the area of sexual ethics, if there's something that we know is not right, Father, may you allow us to take steps to turn away from that. And Father, if we're not grateful people, if people don't know us to be ones that express gratitude and joy at what you're doing, help us to work on that as well so that we can have your smiling face blessing us so that we can celebrate your goodness and your faithfulness till the time you take us home. For this we pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord for the book of Numbers and, his obe- and the, the obedience we see there. Again, I think we give Israel and the Israelites a hard time, but man, there's so many truths that we can learn from them and hold on to, and they were obedient for the first 10 chapters, right? So we want to hold on. We want to persevere in that obedience, all right? Uh, thank you again. Can we thank uh, Dr. Coakley for coming and sharing with us? 
just as way of closing here, uh, there are a couple announcements that we have for today. So today there will be a meeting for Right to the Heart in room 202. Room 202, by the way, it's on the left-hand side. It's the one with the stairs. So if you are good at writing, all right, I'm better with a left to the stomach instead of right to the heart. Um, but if you are good at writing, all right, and you have a gift in that way, um, we are really looking, sorry, I saw moaning down here. I apologize. <laughs> Threw me off guard. Uh, if you enjoy writing and would like to know more about this heartfelt ministry, stop by for a brief info meeting. Uh, this is open to middle school on up. So middle school students, high school students, anyone that enjoys writing, uh, you are welcome to go to that. Again, it's the classroom on the left as you're walking out. It's, it has the stairs in it. All right, so room 202 right after service. Second announcement, we have Trunk or Treat coming up at the end of the month. This is uh, really an awesome outreach um, and I mean that. We have an opportunity to share Christ. Even with the simple gesture of passing out candy, we can do this. All right, so some of you may say, oh, I don't agree with Halloween. But can I just encourage you? This is relationship building. We have a unique church building in that we are in a community, in a neighborhood, where people are going to be walking around regardless of whether we do anything or not. Let's take hold of that opportunity to build relationships with them, to have an opportunity to share Christ with them. That's really the heart behind why we do Trunk or Treat. It's not just to give away candy and get all sugared up, which again, I love, all right? But um, at the same time, we wanna do it purposefully and intentionally and share Christ with them. So if we can do that through even a, a dropping off of candy, we wanna do that. So you may say, I don't have a car that I can even donate. We have people that have been willing to give a car that you could decorate the trunk and we have decorations here. So I would encourage you, talk to Donna Gabo. Uh, there's sign up at the Welcome Center. Sign up to participate. And maybe you say, I'm just able to serve. Uh, I could set up. Whatever it may be, just come be a part of it. We would love to have you be a part of that night. Um, third announcement here. We have the new mailbox system is now open. Some of you may be going, I didn't even know we had a mailbox system. We didn't until now. And this is something new that we've just been thinking of as a staff um, this is in the foyer here. We have tables, and right by the high tables, there's a spot where your name is on a folder. If, uh, if you do not see it, stop by the Welcome Center. We can add this. Uh, Donna can get you a way to get a folder there. Uh, so one, please don't be offended if you don't see your name there already. But two, we can get you a folder. We just thought it would be, especially with Christmas coming up and Thanksgiving, way to pass notes within the church body is it would be a great way to do that. And so I already had someone ask me, what about all the hate mail I'm gonna be getting? Well, that's okay, all right? Don't worry about that. If that's happening, we'll adjust that. But let's be positive about this, all right? Use it for encouragement, not for tearing each other down. So build each other up, all right, in that way. And so we're looking forward to that, and that's just something new that we're trying out and uh, excited about it. Uh, lastly, Dan wanted me to announce a special event that happened and the one that I could think of first off was 20 years ago. There was a Monday night football game uh, against the Colts and his Tampa Bay Bucks, uh, where the Colts came back and won it. Oh, sorry, that's not the one you were wanting me to talk about. Oh, he's shaking his head no. Anyway, you can ask me about that after service. No, <laughs> the better event that happened three years ago this week, uh, we hired Pastor, well, sorry, he was already on staff, but we uh, made the decision to make him as a pastor of worship and leadership. So three years ago, Pastor Chewy officially was pastor of worship and leadership. So he would tell you that's not a big deal. I say it is a big deal. One, October's Pastor Appreciation Month. So uh, give not, that's not for me, that's for him, okay? So um, please come tell him how much you're thankful for him. He was on staff before that again. He's been on staff now six years. Yeah, something like that. But again, it's a big deal. We made him the pastor of worship and leadership. So let's celebrate that. And maybe don't, don't make a chewy, if you don't want to like glorify a chewy there, let's glorify the Lord for that, right? That's an awesome opportunity to praise God and look back. So we take hold of those moments and we praise God for him. With that being said, I'm going to invite you to stand and I'm going to dismiss us. Sorry for the longer closing here this morning. Just have a lot going on, a lot coming up. So there's plenty of ways for you to serve. How are you going to do it? right? Be a part of it. We'd love to have you be a part of it. So let me pray for us as we close. Lord, we love you. And we're so thankful for all the different ministries we have going on right now with right to the heart coming up and trunk or treat. Lord, we just praise you again that you are our God. May we submit our lives to you. May we know you 
And may we live in anticipation of the truth that you are coming soon. And so we may, may we be active about sharing your gospel message with those around us. Allow us to pursue even the topics that were mentioned today of se- sexual ethics and obedience to your word and gratitude to you, Lord. We're so thankful for your word. May we always preach your word faithfully and true. We love you, Lord, and we look forward to your soon return. We pray all these things now in your name. Amen. Have an awesome week, church family. Mike cut out. That's all good. Have an awesome week, church family. We love you.